Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name's Dr. Clayton Johnson, your host for today's episode. Joining me is Dr. Daryl Holtkamp with Iowa State University. Welcome, Daryl. Would you like to give the audience a brief introduction? Yeah, thanks for the invitation to, to join you here today, Clayton. And yeah, I'm Daryl Holtkamp. I'm a professor uh, in the College of Veterinary Medicine at Iowa State University and uh, specialize in biosecurity and uh, economics of animal health and, and the classification of herds, which uh, uh, is the topic today. Very good. Daryl, you and I recently got to work on a project with classifying herds for their PERS status. And this is a, a project you've been involved with for the, the better part of a decade, if not longer. You know, why ultimately, Daryl, is disease classification important to pig producers and veterinarians? Yeah, I, I think it, you know, it's uh, evolved over time. Uh, I can't tell you, Clayton, when we, when we first set out to develop uh, the original PERS classification system that we had a complete uh, vision of what it would turn into. And so, uh, but since it was created and published originally in 2010, published in 2011, uh, it really has been, I, I would say the main thing it, it did was provide a roadmap for producers for managing PERS virus uh, in sow herds. And so, you know, decisions on uh, vaccinating, on uh, closing herds, on opening herds back up again, all of those were really kind of guided by that initial uh, sort of uh, vision of the classification system. And, and you know, I, if I'm honest, uh, you know, we probably had uh, more humble aspirations when we first set out to do this, uh, uh, you know, and, and it came out of uh, frustration for uh a lack of terminology, right? We would uh, have to explain ourselves every time we use the term, well, this herd is is negative, or, you know, you have the term double negative for PERS virus. And you always had to ask, well, what do you mean by that, right? And so, uh, um, you know, in some of it, we, we were, I uh, was working with Dale Polson on, uh, you know, putting together the uh, pattern app, which uh, no longer used that, but it was a biosecurity survey back in the, in the early 2000s that we were developing. And and again, we wanted to ask questions about the classification of herds for their their per status, but we didn't know how to how to how to word that right because we lacked that that standard terminology that everybody understood. And so that was kind of the humble beginnings. But it really, I think, has uh, facilitated uh, that communication piece. But it also, probably more importantly, it, again, it provided that roadmap for commute for producers uh, for veterinarians to communicate that uh, to producers, but also with each other as well. Where'd you get the initial inspiration for the original PERS herd classification system? Were there other diseases or other industries that had similar systems you could model this after? No, um, I, I don't. We didn't uh, have any uh, other uh, industry or other diseases that we uh, that we tried to model it after. Uh, I, I would describe it as is well. It was more grueling than that. Uh, so it was probably. Uh, over four or five years uh, of, of just kind of sometimes not even formally meeting, but just uh, getting off onto that topic and, and saying, well, you know, if we had such a thing, what would it look like? And and so it was more just back and forth brainstorming on that and and uh, would have been nice to have a, have a model to work with and start with. But I, you know, I don't, as far as I know, we didn't, uh, there wasn't one out there at least uh, that we were able to find. Um, so it was more just a kind of grind it out and, you uh, you know, we got to a point where we felt uh, like we had one that was workable, um, but we wanted to get the industry input uh, on that at that point and make sure it was something that was practical uh, and, and, and could be used by producers and veterinarians. And so that's when uh, uh, we put together a working group and, and uh, the late Bob Morrison uh, was the one that uh, actually did that with some funds from a USDA PERS cap uh, that Bob Rowland had at Kansas State University at that time. And, and so that was kind of the, the initial um, uh, impetus for, uh, uh, you know, kind of developing the, the final version that became what was, you know, finally uh, the, the industry, what we proposed to be the industry standard. And I think that was a really good process because, uh, as you know, Clayton, I think you were involved in that effort as well. But these, these committees can be um, uh, really uh, valuable. But if you try to start from scratch or something like that, the committees are not, not a very good way to get to uh, a final product. There's maybe too many opinions at the table, but in this case, I think we had a skeleton at least of one. And, and so that committee was able to get that over the, 
uh, over the hump and, and come up with what I thought I think ended up being a very workable uh, classification system. Well, certainly, Daryl, it's been something that's been widely adopted by the industry, which I think is always a signal that it's been well received. What did you learn from the rollout of that initial PERS classification system as producers started to adopt it and tailor it to what they wanted to use it for? Yeah, I'd say there are several things we learned, Clayton. One is that, uh, you know, it didn't happen overnight. Uh, the adoption uh, occurred relatively slowly, I would say, uh, early on. Uh, I think a key uh, uh, event, let's call it, uh, was when uh, Bob Morrison again uh, started gathering data for the Swine Health Monitoring Project, and he used uh, basically that classification system, right? And so I think that was, in terms of awareness, was kind of a watershed moment uh, that the whole industry became aware of it at that point. <clears throat> um, you know, and I, I think another thing we've learned is that even though there's specific guidelines or uh, guidance, let's say, on you know the diagnostic protocols uh, to use, how frequently, what to sample, how often to sample, how to test it, um, even though those guidelines exist, everybody you know kind of has put their own uh, fingerprint on that, uh, and and so there's a lot of variation or a fair amount of variation then in how people are doing it exactly, but it's still you know it's sort of I described it sometimes as. Uh, at least it defines the greater ditches, right? Uh, keeps you keeps you on the road in general there. So, so that's number two. I think um, uh, you know, and, and in terms of adoption, once once it kind of caught on in the United States, uh, you know, it even I think it uh, I I think it's pretty much in every part of the world now. I, I know uh, in Europe, Europe was probably the next to uh, start using it. I had opportunities to give you know some presentations over there and uh, in, in saw it. In others' presentations, they were using that classification system, and, and even in Asia now, I think uh, uh, you probably know better than I, but I believe it is at least used uh, at, in, at times over there. So, so that was kind of the big learnings. And then, as time progressed, Clayton, uh, the other things we started to realize was that um, you know, especially you know, we created this uh, category two positive stable category, and and used the term stable. Uh, to define those. And, and what we really meant by stable, as, as you well recall, was the ability to consistently wean negative pigs. And, and we all know in practice, then that, that proves to be challenging, right? And even, even though, uh, you know, herds could officially or technically meet the criteria we had laid out, sometimes a, a week, two weeks, a month later, three months later, they would come back and start, you know, you'd, you'd have another positive there. And so, there was always that challenge in, in, you know, sort of figuring out, do we truly have a positive, stable herd? And some of that, I think, was was due to limitations, right? We, we wanted to limit uh, the diagnostic evidence that was required so that it was practical. In other words, not, not too expensive, not too time consuming to do. And the reality is, I think we probably lack some sensitivity there, right, in, in terms of, you know, being able to detect whether that virus was still circulating in that herd or not. We probably missed it at times, and we call that that herd positive stable, but it was you know likely still there. So, so we knew we had issues with that. Uh, we also you know had the advent of some new sample types like uh, processing fluids, like family oral fluids, uh, things like that, and and uh, we felt like we uh, had an opportunity maybe to uh, add some of those in and make make it a little bit easier, cheaper to uh, monitor these monitor these herds and then classify them. So. All those things were kind of things that led up to the to the, the updated classification system that that you participated in again here a while back that was just recently published in in the Journal of Swine Health and Production uh, in uh, last uh, fall's edition. So, Daryl, you spent years crafting this, developing it. You rolled it out to the industry. They applied it. New tools, new diagnostic sample types were were available, and you updated it. Now this updated publications out there with all those lessons learned included, what do you hope that producers and veterinarians get out of this new updated classification tool that you've kind of guided through another publication process? Yeah, I, I think, you know, probably not anything revolutionary at this point. Um, you know, I, we, we tried to um, not change it so drastically that it looked completely different than what it did before. Um, but as you know, we did add uh, a couple new categories. So we split category one, category two, uh, I'm sorry, category one into a positive, unstable, uh, high prevalence and a positive, unstable, low prevalence. So one A and one B. Uh, part of that was driven by 
uh, uh, producers, veterinarians, uh, telling us that uh, these herds after outbreaks um, at some point get back to weaning, uh, still weaning a positive pig, uh, but the productivity uh, is pretty good in those herds, right? They're still weaning, uh, getting back to baseline production, weaning the pigs in grow finish do fairly well. And, and so we wanted to create a category, sort of a home or a destination, if you will, on, on the roadmap for managing PERS uh, for those herds, because, you know, either out of uh, lack of trying or uh, lack of desire, uh, you know, they, they were going to leave those herds uh, in that category and, and basically consider them to be controlled, right? Um, and then the other thing we did was, was uh, deal with the vaccination in the positive stable herds. So we defined that more clearly. Uh, for herds that are going to use vaccination, MLV vaccination in particular, uh, versus those herds that are not. And so that was, you know, the, really the changes. But I, you know, fundamentally, Clayton, I don't know that, that 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 should those changes should necessarily change what producers and veterinarians were doing previously or how they used the herd classification system. And and so I, you know, I think it's uh, it's more just become familiar with the the changes that have been made. Uh, and, and again, that's the, the JSHAP, uh, talk to your veterinarian or if you are a veterinarian that, you know, that's published in JSHAP. I think it's uh, fairly well laid out uh, in that publication. And so uh, I think it's just a matter of getting the word out now and letting everybody know that uh, the system has been modified a little bit. Well, thank you very much, Daryl, for your service to the industry and in developing both of these publications. Um, you know, I think most of us uh, aspire to create one tool that the industry can adopt as widely as, as a tool like this classification system is. And Daryl, whether it's, uh, you know, PERS management or biosecurity, you've certainly created numerous tools that producers and veterinarians alike have benefited from. Thank you for that. And thank you for coming on our show today. And to everyone else, thank you very much for listening to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast. Please visit us at swinehealthblackbelt.com and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so that you won't miss out on the next episode. Thanks and see you next week. Hey everyone, we're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health related research trial and would like to come on the show to talk about it with me and share it with our audience, feel free to send an email to healthblackbelt at swineit.com and we would love to take a look at your research. Thank <laughs> you.